Hello and welcome to Lecture 3, Errors in Perception. Believing really is seeing. We have a very strong tendency to see what we believe. In this picture, do you see Santa Claus? You know, if you had no idea who Santa Claus was, you just see an old man with a beard. But we, Santa Claus is in our mythology. Santa Claus is in our history. We see Santa Claus all over the place. And when we see somebody that looks like Santa Claus, right away we perceive Santa Claus, that our believing is seeing. You cannot trust what you think you perceive. And this seems really strange to think, is like I can't trust, trust my own perceptions. And yes, that's true. There are just too many flaws in the way our brains construct our perceptions. Perceptions definitely are not passive. Your, your eyes take in this information and your brain processes this information. For example, what do you see in this picture? Do you see a couple in an intimate embrace? Now, this is a rather interesting picture. When you show this to individuals who do not have experience with couples and intimate embraces, they do not have experience with uh, individuals in their naked form, what they actually see in this picture is a series of dolphins. Do you see the dolphins? See if I can get my mousey working here. There's a dolphin right here, and a dolphin here, and a dolphin here, and a dolphin here, over here, and over here. A series of dolphins. That our brains construct this series of dolphins into a rather intimate picture. The brains take in this information, they process it through our belief systems, through our attitudes, through our prejudices, through our fears. All of this stuff gets processed this is why two different people can see the exact same thing and yet they don't see the same thing. Their perceptions are entirely different. It's one of the reasons why eyewitnesses in a court of law are one of the very weakest witnesses there is because of the perceptions. We see different things. Our brains actively construct the perceptions just based on a tiny bit of information. When we're sitting in, a, in a, a room, there is so much that you're not thinking about. You're not even noticing. Your brain's taking all this in, but it's only focusing on a very, very small part of this. There's a video here that I'm not showing in this uh, clip, but I do show it in class, that magicians take advantage of this. Magicians know how to manipulate your thought processes so you focus what on what they want you to focus on and you don't focus on what they're actually doing. They move this perception over. They've realized how to utilize this flaw in our perceptions. Let's take a look at a couple other examples. You know, perception versus reality. How about your hamburger that you get at a fast food store? When you see the images of it, you see all oh, that wonderful big juicy thing and this is our perception but when you really look at it there's slightly different reality involved into this. Don't mean to offend anybody but I like the way this this uh, poster is, is uh, stated. Others don't always see us as we see ourselves and that's pretty good. Sometimes we see ourselves as wonderful great people that others don't see. Some people sometimes we see ourselves as terrible rotten people that others don't see that our perceptions even of ourself are highly highly distorted and another example I, I saw this one on a greeting card one time I thought it was a great example mirror mirror on the wall who's the bravest cat of all and this little kitty cat looks in that picture and sees this great big old lion looking back our perceptions are uh, greatly affected by what's going on inside of us we are not seeing reality we're seeing our version of reality. How about this one, the difference between men and women? Some of you might recognize this feeling uh, just by looking at this image that the perception of the women and the perception of the men totally different aspects of this. Let's go on to another one. You know, how you dress is important. Your dress puts out a certain perception of you. And in this picture, what do you think of this young lady dressed like this? What do you think of somebody dressed in a suit and tie? What do you think of somebody dressed casually? We have some strong perceptions. As a really good example of how our brains fool us, look at this image. Here's this young lady spinning around in a circle. 
But do you see her spinning clockwise, or do you sp see her spinning counterclockwise? Does she, does she switch back and forth? This is a powerful uh, example of how our brains change us. You might have two people sitting side by side looking at the same image, and one person is going to see her spinning clockwise, and the next person is going to see her spinning counterclockwise. Even the time of the year affects our perceptions. How about this little picture? Look at this. Do you see a duck? Or how about a bunny rabbit? You see the, both the duck and the bunny rabbit? We have the duck with the bill over here. Or this could be the bunny rabbit, and this is the ears, and here's the eye, and looking kind of up in space over here. This one's a really interesting one. When you show this one to children, during most of the times of the year, the children will see a duck. But when you show this picture to children, when it's closer to Easter, they will see a bunny rabbit. Do even the times of year affect our perception? <coughs> most people have seen this one. When you first look at this picture, do you see the young woman or do you see the old woman? And uh, what your thoughts are uh, about youth and about beauty and about aging, about your, even your self-esteem, are reflected into what do you, who do you see first, the young woman or the older woman? That I'm taking in this image through my sight senses, and yet my brain's processing this and changing this around to either I see a young woman turned slightly away from me or an old woman in profile. When you look here, what do you see? Here we have a good example of uh, visual pareidolia, where really the only thing that's on this page is a whole bunch of computer symbols. But our brains put this together, and what we actually see here, what we perceive, is a zebra. But in reality, there is no zebra here. There is no picture of a zebra here. It's just how our brains has put this, have put our perception of reality together. And artists take advantage of this. Artists, very abstract art necessarily, we imbue meaning on this. We, uh, our brains put this into a logical aspect of this is what this is a picture of. It bring up emotional feelings. All sorts of stuff involved in, in the perceptions. And even our misperceptions can cause some serious uh, mental problems. And mental problems, on the other hand, could be a, a, an example of how our perceptions can go awry. That if you see yourself on a regular basis as being too bad, then we start getting into all sorts of aspects like depression and eating disorders. Uh, all, all sorts of, of problems come up when our perceptions of ourselves are too far on the negative side from reality. And this is actually a serious issue when we look at things like anorexia. And I, this picture you look up now, nobody actually sees themselves like this. But yes, people actually do see themselves like this. This young lady standing there looking in the mirror may very well see her reflection just like it's reflected here, even though she is in reality just skin and bones. But she sees herself much different than being in skin and bones. Our, our brains are taking in these percept th this visual aspect and processing it with our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, all of our past experiences, the interactions with, we've had each other, our, our self-concept, our self-image, and literally causes us to see different things. In the field of psychology, they really take advantage of this, of how our brains put meaning to images and this perception form in many psychological exams. One that you might have heard of before is the simple Rorschach ink block test. When you look at the simple black and white ink block, what do you see? Do you see a couple of clowns? Do you see a mask? Do you see bugs? Do you see a face? What is it that you see? And what you see tells me about what your thought patterns are. Here's another one. And what do you see here? Uh, a couple of circus bears, a couple of clowns, you see a spaceship, uh, a couple of squished bugs. As you start creating stories around these, you bring up your past, you bring up all of your thoughts and your ideas and your belief systems, and you put them together into this meaningful whole that we call a perception. 
there's another really interesting psychological exam, psychological inventory, called the thermatic apperception test. Thermatic apperception test, I would show you a series of pictures like this, and I have two of them here on this uh, PowerPoint. And I would ask you, tell me a story about this. What's this woman doing? What was she doing just prior to this picture? What is she going to be doing just after this picture? And start telling me a story about this. And as you start creating the story, I start learning about your mental processes. Because this is what we do. We take all of this information in and we, we process it differently. Your story is going to be different than somebody else's story. Maybe not a whole lot different, but a little bit different. It won't be a whole lot different because most of us come from pretty much the same culture. We have basically the same background. If you were to give two different people with significantly different backgrounds this picture to tell a story about, we're going to come up with two entirely different stories. How about this picture? Here's two women in what looks like maybe a laboratory. What's going on? What happened right before this picture? What happened, what's happening during this picture? What's going to happen right after this picture? Who are these two women? What are their roles? What are their jobs? Do they have relations with each other as far as are they sisters? Are they mother-daughter? What's, what's going on in this, this, uh, this picture? And as you start telling the story, your background is starting to come into the story. If you had absolutely no experience with uh, uh, science, then chances are these people will not be scientists. If you, the only experience that you have with women working like this is in a kitchen, well then your story is going to be that they're in a kitchen. If you had no experience of women um, being in roles of authority or being educated, you're definitely not going to come up with stories that one person's the instructor and the other one's is the student, or maybe their co-workers trying to work something out. Our brains process information and they compare it to what reality is. And then we get, sometimes we get these images that really don't fit reality, so our brain tries to force them into it. And this is where we get things like optical illusions. In the first picture up on the top side, do you see a vase or do you see faces? It might be this, this, that you're seeing faces or it might be that you're seeing vase. Neither one of these are, are right, neither one of these are wrong. And look at that horseshoe magnet-like looking one. It's actually impossible uh, to have this in the real life world. But our brain puts this together, this two-dimensional object, and puts it together into a three-dimensional object. And it looks really good until we really start tracing the lines back and go, hmm, this can't really exist. And when you look down at the little cubes on the bottom side, we see these as three-dimensional objects but they're really not three-dimensional objects. Our brain creates the 3D aspect. They're just two-dimensional objects on a flat sheet of paper. And the same with that triangle thing. We see it as a three-dimensional object, but it's quite literally simple, uh, simply a two-dimensional object. Our brain makes this assumption about the consistency of the world and the relative size and shape uh, of what objects are supposed to be and then takes our visual input and plays with it a little bit to give us a perception. On this one, do you see the horses in here? Our brains are making all sorts of assumptions about these horses. When they're blended in with the snow and the rock, our brains are putting this image together for us. And once you see the horses, you can't not see the horses. Once you see one of these optical illusions, you can't not see it. Your brain is stuck into this little mode. A very common one is called the moon and the horizon illusion. When the moon first rises over the horizon, it appears to be significantly larger than when the moon is high in the sky. And that's simply because when the moon is just right over the horizon, what we have is something to compare the moon to. We have the trees, or in this case a building, we have some, some part on the land where we can compare in our brain the size of the moon to the stuff on the ground. But when the, the, the moon is high in the sky, the only thing we can compare it to is the stars or the clouds, and we really don't know how large those are to begin with. And so that 
our brains make it appear that when the moon is, is on the horizon, the moon is actually significantly much larger. And it could be some issues on here. There was an air battle uh, over Los Angeles in 1945. 1945, World War II going on, uh, all of the United States was, was very, very nervous, especially around the coastal towns. Remember in 1941, uh, we have Pearl Harbor going on. We could be attacked at any time. Well, something occurred over Los Angeles that the people manning the anti-aircraft guns saw something. They perceived something in the sky. And as soon as one of these individuals started firing, then everybody else started firing too. Even though it later uh, found out there was absolutely nothing in the sky over Los Angeles in 1945. There was no hostile planes, there were no balloons, there were no blimps. It was our uh, imagination, for the most part, that came into a play with all of these fears that we already had, the high anxiety, all of this adrenaline running through, and somebody perceived something in the atmosphere and took that as a hostile attack. Then it became contagious and went from one person to another person to another person until there was a whole air battle over Los Angeles with enemy aircraft that never actually did exist. We look at our perceptions, it's not just our visual perceptions, but all of our other senses can also be fooled and we have perceptions from our other se senses. A real good example th of this is wine tasting. And this is something, one of these little experiments that has been done time and time again, where your taste is not just determined by the taste buds on your tongue, it's not just determined by the scent of something, but also by the texture and by the sight of something. In several wine tasting experiments, what they have done is given uh, professional wine tasters some wine and have them describe the wine. But what they did was give the professional wine tasters white wine that was dyed to look like red wine. They get put it in bottles that had very sophisticated labels to make it uh, look like a much more sophisticated wine. And they asked these professional wine tasters to actually taste and evaluate and describe the wine. And some of them liked the wine and some of them didn't like the wine. But these professional wine tasters described the white wine in terms of red wine language. So that even though they were drinking white wine, they were tasting white wine, the white wine looked like red wine. The labels on the bottles confirmed that it was red wine. So they had their visual senses saying that this is red wine and they're describing it as if it is red wine. Even something as simple as our gender perceptions. It's not just visual. This is a little video that I won't show here on this, this clip. Uh, but our gender perceptions, whether it be male, female or even male, is not just how somebody looks, but it's also our perceptions of how somebody sounds. Do that, does that person sound male or does that person sound female? It's also how they move. We can tell whether somebody's a male or female simply by how they move. How they move. To illustrate the point of how our, how our senses overlap, there's a, uh, an effect called the McGurk effect. And this is where I have an individual uh, recording, visually record themselves saying ba, ba, ba. But then I override that with a separate audio track with somebody saying da, da, da. And when you look at this, you see the lips going ba, 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 but it hears in your, your ears going da, da, da. What you can hear is them saying ga, ga, ga. And you actually literally hear this. Your brain has this perception of this. There is an effect on our perception called temporal synchronization. Temporal synchro synchronization is you see my lips moving and you hear my voice and you put that together. And that's fine and wonderful as long as we're standing relatively close together. It looks like my lips are forming these words and the words coming you know, from my mouth. But the speed of light is much, much faster than the speed of sound. So you're seeing my lips move, 
before your, he your ears actually hear my words say anything. This becomes most obvious if you ever saw somebody pounding a nail. They're pounding a nail and every time the hammer goes down you see the hammer go down and you hear the hammer go down. And you hear that hammer hit the nail. The speed of you, that light coming from the, the hammer so that you're actually seeing the hammer is traveling much, much faster than the sound of the hammer. But your brain puts this together to make it sound as if they're both happening at exactly the same time. Even though your eyes are receiving the information much quicker than your ears are receiving the information. There becomes a time as we start getting farther and farther and farther apart that the temporal synchronization just stops. It doesn't wean off, it just simply stops and your brain stops putting these things together. It turns out when there is about 80 millisecond difference between your eyes seeing something and your ears hearing it, then your brain actually separates it. So you'll see the person hit the nail and then a moment later you hear the sound. And this is um, right about 30 yards. At right about 30 yards distance is when this 80 millisecond difference comes in. And so you'll hear or you'll see the hammer go down and then you hear the hammer hitting the nail. This is how our brains are putting this information together, but at a certain point that information is too far apart and the brains refuse to do this. It's the same way that our brains project slightly into the future. If you're trying to catch a fastball pitched at you, that ball is coming too fast for you to actually react to the ball. And so what your brain does is it projects the trajectory of that ball and says, okay, that ball is going to be here and actually moves your hand in, into the place of that ball. And fortunately, most of the time you're right, but some of the times you are also incorrect. There is way, way too much information that's coming into our brain for us to pay attention to everything. And so we focus on certain, certain details of this. This is uh, a sensory attention focusing thing. I have a little video here that I'm not going to show in this one, but in class I do show this video. And in this video, there's a crime com been committed. Down here, there's this victim on the floor. And you watch this video and you try and pick out the differences as this video goes. This is called change blindness. That we are typically blind to the things that change if we're not specifically paying attention to them. And even sometimes if we're specifically paying attention to them, we simply don't notice. There's been uh, several experiments done in the speed, speed dating realm. The speed dating where you have uh, all these women sitting on long tables and then the men uh, sit down in front of them and they, you're given you know, three or four minutes to introduce yourself and have a conversation and you go on to somebody else and you go on to somebody else and you go on to somebody else. That during these speed dating times if the woman decides to get up and leave and go to the bathroom, we can replace her with almost any woman and that man won't know the, di won't know the difference. And if you think that's unusual, that's really not unusual. It happens to us all, male or female, because it's a change blindness. It's not something that we were expecting. We filter out all of uh, unnecessary information and we focus just on specifically what we want, whether it's uh, the answers to our questions or whatever it is. Uh, there's an incredible little example here I have in a video where this uh, magician, Darren Brown, replaces himself with somebody else just right out on the street and people don't notice. One person replaces it from another person and people simply don't notice. Even when they replace uh, a short Caucasian with a very tall uh, African American. So it's amazing that this can actually happen. We cannot mul multitask. I know everybody thinks that you can multitask, but you cannot multitask. You cannot do two things at exactly the same time. You cannot talk on the phone and drive at the same time. If you think you can multitask, if you think you can actually do two things at the same time, here's something for you to try. Try reading a book at the same time you're writing a paragraph. Read a book at the same time you're writing a letter. 
try and read the book at the same time you're text messaging somebody. You simply cannot. What we consider multitasking is really switching between tasks very, very quickly. So you cannot do two tasks at once, but you can switch between two tasks very, very quickly. And the problem is that the switch, it takes a little bit of brain power to catch back up again. If I go from task A to task B, now I have to review the history of task, task B a little bit to carry on. Then I go to task A, I have to review the history of task A a little bit to carry on and switching back and forth to all this stuff. Our perceptions of well, the world are not reality. You have a view of what reality is. That person sitting next to you has an entirely different view of what reality is. Hopefully they are enough alike that we can all get along together in the world, that we're not seen as really crazy or psychotic individuals. But our, our realities are entirely different. Uh, if you witness a crime and you happen to be somebody who is uh, a hairdresser, one of the things you're going to notice about the, the perpetrator of the crime is their hair. If you happen to be in, into fashion, you're going to notice their fashion. If you happen to be somebody who is very experienced in handguns, and you know all of the handguns and the different types, you're a weapons fanatic, what you're going to notice is the gun. And you'll all be able to describe slightly different things. And your, all of your reality is correct, but all of your reality is incomplete. So it's, our perception is this construction to never really, really trust your perceptions of reality. And we have a very strong faith that our own perceptions are actually how the world is. But in reality, our perceptions of the world are just as flawed as everybody else's perceptions of the world.